Hi, Griffins. Uh, welcome to the Virtual Volunteer Fair Winter 2021, uh, brought to you by Student Volunteer Connections, also known as SVC, your on-campus volunteer hub. My name is Ray. I am the Local Engagement Coordinator supervising the operations of SVC, and I will be your host today. With us, uh, with us today, we have uh, five community partners, including Connected Canadians, Guelph and District Multicultural Festival, the Ontarian Campus Newsletter, Autism Doc Services, and CFRU Radio Station, uh, who will be taking turns in that order to present to you about their organizations and how you can get involved with them through volunteer work. So please feel free to drop any of your questions in the Q&A box throughout the session. Our presenters will respond to them either after their presentation or in a written reply. And please watch out for important links in our announcements. And this event is part of Winter Project Serve, which are a variety of volunteering related events happening across this week. There are still two more events happening this afternoon at 3 p.m. and tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Uh, both are one-off volunteer opportunities where you get to meet with new people, learn new skills, and connect with the community organizations that you'll be volunteering with virtually. Uh, and when you participate in any of the one, uh, uh, Project Serve events, you have a chance to win one of 25 $5 Starbucks gift card. Uh, so the more you participate, the higher your winning chances. Uh, so please check out uh, the remaining two events with our uh, event schedule that we will be sharing in the announcement right now. And before I start, I just want to shout out quickly to my SVC team who helped to make this uh, all of the Project Serve events possible. There will be more volunteer related uh, events happening uh, across the semester. So if you're interested, and you want to stay updated with us, uh, please enroll on our free SVC course link page using the self registration tab on course link uh, main page, which we'll also be sharing in the announcement. If all of this is a little bit too much to remember, don't worry, you can just connect with us at svc at uoguaf.ca with any of your volunteering related questions. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to welcome the first uh, presenter, uh, Cam from Can uh, Connected Canadians. <clears throat> All right, Cam, if you give me one quick sec, I'll just project your slide. Absolutely. There you go, you're live. All right, perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ken, and I'm a remote um, mentor, technology mentor, and outreach coordinator for Connected Canadians. So, Connected Canadians, we're a nonprofit organization, and we promote digital literacy skills amongst seniors and older adults uh, by providing them with free technology training and support. Uh, we at Connected Canadians believe that all people should be empowered to use technology safely, effectively, and to be able to engage with loved ones, uh, connect with family members, friends, and just enhance their overall quality of life. Uh, on this slide, you'll notice a, a lot of logos from all of our current collaborators and partners, uh, many of which have, have provided some of our most treasured volunteers. Um, <clears throat> so before I get into what being a volunteer at Connected Canadians looks like, I do want to try to play this little video here if it works. This is just some of our client stories. Connected Canadians, connecting older adults with technology, training and support. Today I attended an event with Connected Canadians and they're an organization that helps to pair young tech savvy individuals with yeah. older adults like myself. And then I brought out my little phone and they showed me how to send a message, which I had known how to do before and take a picture. I'm going to ask you um, questions you know, about how your session went. Oh my gosh, I learned so much on my phone because now I know how to go on Facebook on my phone. I know how to uh, send pictures on my phone. Perfect. And I get so excited because it is not easy for a senior. Oh, that's a wonderful idea. Really wonderful idea, especially it's free. <laughs> Perfect. We share what we know. You learn from us and we can learn from you all the technical thing, the modernized world. It's helping you do things. I want to learn. I want to keep learning. Perfect. We uh, we set up your, your email today as well, right? Email. Emails and send it pictures. Oh, and send yeah. talk on it. There's all that fun aspect and it helps you connect with people. When you come here, you learn more and 
and everyone is so nice. Every time we give a workshop, we try to give a new idea or a new topic. If I had my way, I would invite other people in the community to come in. And how would you say it? Get adapted to it. It's not only educational, it's fun. Twitter? Yes. Those, those are some of the things that I learned. Today I then uh, how to uh, use the Google. Especially for getting blind people familiar with uh, Android phones. So this is definitely filling a niche. Case time. Right. Uh, our family is distributed from a communications point of view. Uh, it used to be Skype, now it seems to be FaceTime. And there's games to keep you, uh, keep that memory going. Do you learn new skills like when you use your devices? I press on a button on my hearing aids and I can hear the TV, but sometimes it's too loud. And then I adjust it with this, with my iPhone. <laughs> Perfect, that's fantastic. Now I have a better idea of how it works and why we're having problems. Oh, well, the main difference is that the volunteers are helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, that's fantastic. I did get help. I had more help than I can probably remember today. Yes, we, we have to connect. We need it now because that's the way the world's going. I wish that everybody had access to something like this, you know because we, we do really want to learn. They can always stay connected and to fight isolation and to always kind of like learn new skills on technology. So this is something that we strongly do that. All right. So <clears throat> I just want to go over some of the programs and offerings that we have at Connected Canadians and how volunteers would be engaged uh, working with us. So our biggest program offering are one on one tech support sessions. So these are individual customized support provided by our tech volunteers and they're one hour sessions scheduled at our volunteers convenience. So those are held mostly during evenings and weekends, but it's based on volunteers availability. So if you are available during the week, that's great. If not, that's also OK. So these one on one support sessions are organized under two main programs. The biggest of the two is our tech hotline. So during my job as an outreach coordinator, we get calls and emails every day from seniors and older adults who are looking for some kind of technical support. And it's the kind of support that uh, younger generations like yourselves take for granted and even myself included. Uh, these are things like, you know, how to set up my Apple ID, how to download an app from the App Store, how, where do my downloads go on my PC, um, just really sort of simple stuff like this that, that can cause a lot of anxiety in the minds of the older community. So we try to start off over the phone and then if we can move to screen sharing tools like Zoom or Team Viewer, we try to do that as well. The other main program for our one on one support session is our support for families of hospital patients and volunteers. So of course in hospitals now due to quarantining procedures, um, elderly patients and, and the senior volunteers who help them are more isolated than ever. So to ensure that uh, those family and friends in the hospital have the skills that they need to connect with their loved ones, we have this new program that helps the family members of, of hospital patients get connected virtually with the patients that are, that are isolated in the hospital. Another offering that we have are remote workshop sessions. So these are groups of up to 15 seniors held over Zoom and we'd have two or more uh, tech volunteers that are instructors on a common topic for the workshop. That could be uh, social media, internet safety, scam prevention, how to spot fake news, uh, accessing government websites online. And these are held on weekends or business or business hours, depending on, uh, on, on who our volunteers are. Another program that we have are Connections Through Art. So we've partnered with the National Gallery of Canada. Uh, it's a new initiative that allows seniors to connect with one of our volunteers virtually, and the volunteer will walk them through a virtual art tour. And this is more important than ever as we are isolated with COVID-19, unable to experience so much of the art and culture out there in person that we would normally be able to. So we love to be able to provide this to our senior community. We 
also have a, a program going on called our mail advice program. So we are partnered with HelpAge Canada to supply uh, iPads to seniors in need across Canada to their um, like uh, long term living assisted uh, facilities. So we distribute the iPads. They're pre configured with required tools and any apps we feel that the seniors would benefit from. And then they get hooked up with some remote sessions with our volunteers to help them get familiar with the iPads. And I just want to skip ahead to a very quick video of one of those clients that I worked with um, with that iPad program. She's a 94 year old Holocaust survivor that I spent six uh, remote sessions with. So I just want to play this quick video for you as well. I am Gertrude and I'm 94 years old in March. I've never been on a computer. This it gave me so much opportunity to do the things that I never had before. Quilting and recipes, news from Europe. I was able to call my niece way in Italy. I'm on Facebook, so my nephew he wants to be connected and all the people that I met that want to be my friends, church and news, so much more that I'm learning. I'm very happy with that. And I recommend it 100% anybody who is able and has still good mind, go ahead and do it. Oops. Move ahead here. So the next steps for you as volunteers, you would uh, we encourage you to register on our website, and that will be posted along with some of our social media links uh, by the uh, Protect and Serve Guelph team here. Um, so yeah, we do thank you for patience if it takes a, a day or two for us to reach back out to you, um, but we really encourage that you uh, sign up and volunteer, and we would love to have you at Connected Canadians. So thank you so much. And that's the end of that. Thank you, Ken. Um, all right, folks uh, in the in the audience, if you have any questions for Ken, please drop a question in the Q&A box and uh, uh, we'll be able to answer you. Uh, but for now, we don't see any questions for you right now, Ken. So um, I but I do have a quick one. Um, I find sometimes with volunteering, um, we lose um, applicants in the process of um, applying for an opportunity. Uh, are you able to tell tell us a little bit about how that application process look like uh, when they reach out to you? How the, how long does it take? Uh, are you look, looking for specific skills that they they will need to, in order to qualify for applying? Um, if you could speak to that a little bit. Absolutely, and I did see a question come in. Um, so we do uh, have a, an onboarding process where volunteers first provide um, they provide a vulnerable sector check. Um, we also onboard them by just giving them um, a quick run through of a presentation from Connected Canadians um, where we show them our steps of service and, and what's required to be a volunteer and, and sort of how we expect our volunteers to behave during sessions with seniors. And we also put them through a, a one hour session with one of our, uh, our test seniors. So we have a senior who will impersonate um, a senior who's looking for technical support and they'll just be um, sort of graded on their performance um, based on on that session with that senior. Um, sorry, did I miss anything that you had asked there, Ray? Or... Um, I think that's it. And the question is about uh, what specific skills uh, do you require of the volunteers when they uh, apply? So we, we know specific skills. We just require a, a patience and a, an open mind and open heart. And you know, it's hard to judge one's technical abilities with technology, but generally we find uh, all the applicants that we have are comfortable enough to be put in the volunteer um, position. So no specific um, uh, skills per se, but we do try to bring on uh, volunteers who have some life experience, some ability to to um, to to work through, you know, a, a session with a senior and to be able to like problem solving skills. So no specific requirements. 
but just uh, a comfort with technology and a comfort with working with seniors. <clears throat> um, so what kind of outreach does Connected Canadians do? We're constantly looking to partner with new organizations. Um, we're constantly looking to innovate the types of programs that we offer to uh, our senior communities. Um, so we're, 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 I'm constantly checking, uh, my, like looking for new organizations that, that could benefit from our partnership and from, um, yeah, from, from the services that we provide. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ken. Okay. Um, that's great. I think what I'm hearing is um, your passion, your interest is more in, important than than skills. And and sounds like the opportunity that you offer with connect, connected Canadians is something that you kind of learn as you go as well, because this is te technology and there might be new platforms. There might be things that's like new features. Uh, obviously, you you get to learn about those things as you teach uh, the seniors as well. So that's that's really awesome. Yeah, and I'll just add to that that the, the benefit that seniors get from from these sessions is not so much the technical expertise; it's the connection that they get to make with a fa on face to face with our volunteers, and the the requests that come in are so simple um, for for people like ourselves for for the younger um, um, generations, um, but. It's, it's that just having that calm, easygoing, patient voice to walk them through um, something that, that is really beneficial. That's awesome. So there's definitely that social piece as well, which is more than uh, ever important now. Uh, so that's that's great. All right. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, I will move on with our presenters. Uh, and if you have more questions for can throughout the presentations, please do drop them in the Q&A box and he will be able to answer by replying to them. All right, next up we have uh, Sin Suja from Guelph and District Multicultural Festival. All right, Sin Suja, just give me one quick sec and you're live. Thank you. Uh, even before I start, I have to say I was smiling when I was listening to Connecting Canadians. It, it really just brings smile when you see those older people getting connected. So awesome job. Thank you for the session because I never knew about connecting Canadians before. So that's great. About us, uh, Guelph and District Multicultural Festival has been in existence since 1978, celebrating diversity and multiculturalism in Canada. But I think they only ran, ran it for like nine or 10 years and then they had a break and then starting 1998, they started again having a larger event at Riverside Park. And right now we have completed 33 years of festival. And I have been hired as the new executive director, just one year old. So uh, what I understand is for the past 33 years, the only event that this organization did was celebrating celebration through a large three day weekend festival in June. With the COVID, you know how things have changed. So with the COVID, as well as my experience in banking, international development, United Nations, and you know, very different background, manufacturing, University of Guelph. Uh, so I'm coming up with new uh, directions for our organizations where we are going to be actively promoting multiculturalism, diversity and inclusion. The festival did a great job. It was a celebration brings, bringing people together to express their culture through art, performance and food and for others to come and experience this art, food and performance. So that's what we did in a very lively, entertaining way. What we thought we'll start doing is a little bit more active on a regular basis, not once a year event. So what we have started, which uh, the first thing we have started on this is uh, we started con contacting, you know, reaching out saying we are ready to provide open conversation sessions like a lunch and learn or a training or a workshop to have open conversation about multiculturalism, diversity and inclusion. It, we were lucky that we got traction pretty soon and we actually are providing a three hour workshop for the Guelph Police Service new recruits on an ongoing basis every three months. So they basically come out with a better understanding of who, multi, why is multiculturalism to be celebrated? What, what is diversity and what is inclusion? So we're doing that as well as I've also joined the chamber 
right now so that you know in the past for the festival our relationship with several organization was to collect donation a very passive way of promoting diversity and inclusion it was only in the name of festival that we had contact so what we are going to do right now for 2021 is now that i'm part of the guelph chamber we are going to take this to the business sector not just for fundraising but to actually promote this so meaning maybe we'll support with the uh, lunch and learn for different organizations or you know if they want to have an open conversation about it get people started thinking about it and talking about it so we're doing that also working with the united way to promote such things using uh, lunch and learn events like that the other thing what i actually said i have to say thanks to ray is uh, We've been trying very hard to include youth. And so this is our initiative and this is kind of a marketing and a promoting material to, you know, talk with the University of Guelph students and recruit them into this concept of multiculturalism, diversity and inclusion specifically like this. We as an older adult who have new immigrants, we passed few years we've understood Guelph or Canada and then you know we are trying to maintain our system maintain our traditions but the students you know they are the younger generation right now they are focusing more on education science which is excellent but there are also people who are having shared vision who are international students who have become migrants they also want to express their you know their identity and continue with their identity and maintain it so we are trying to have some youth program uh, with high school as well as with the university as well as conestoga college and uh, right now i'm trying to recruit high school uh, university students so we can actually work with the high school the high school students will probably get a little bit more excited having college university students talk to them than you know old people going and talking to them old people have great advantage I'm exploring more ideas with them later, but then, you know, the university seems to be very passionate. And yesterday I had a two hour session with them and we came out with some really brilliant ideas. One was, of course, to work with the high school students. Two is to actually have a Guelph's Got Multicultural Talent kind of a performance arena other than the festival. We probably will consider another, you know, in six months so, because right now we have in June. So maybe in January we'll have another indoor event where we have an expression of talents, multicultural talents. And the other one we were talking about was basically how what's the science behind traditions? Because a lot of traditions are multicultural. It's because I follow a certain tradition as an Indian, as a Chinese, as an African. We follow certain traditions blindly. And I think these days the youth, any tradition you say, that's good for you. And they're like, What's the science behind it? You know, and so we thought, you know, this will be a very engaging one for the youth to actually. Yeah, this is what my grandmother says. You know, when I get a pimple, my grandmother asks me to do this. But nowadays the kids want science behind it. So, you know, trying to have so we're trying to consider having some podcast series as well as other youth initiatives. Uh, and I saw these uh, questions with an eyes. And I like this question because how much experience does one need to volunteer? And I will answer that from my organization point of view. There is no need for experience. There is only need for interest and intent. A shared vision is to make a more respectful, acceptable community. So we are doing our part and we want to actually collaborate with different age group, with the youth and the older people and the mid age so that we make our Guelph community a better place. So if you have the interest and intent, that's already good. And the other question you had was what kind of outreach are you doing? The outreach I'm doing right now is trying to reach out, expand the network by communicating, by talking to people, picking up the call, fixing an appointment and just talk to each other because I really believe this idea of diversity and inclusion sky's the limit, meaning we are here as a dot, which direction we want to expand, sky's the limit. It can go into wellness. It can go into, uh, you know, entertainment. It can go into learning from each other. It, it really, sky's the limit. So we are open to any ideas that you have. And we are again, you know, past 33 years was the festival. Now we are starting in a new direction. So from that point of view, we are a baby organization. So we are totally uh, open to uh, suggestions and involvement. And is there anything else?
Yeah, and our most uh, biggest supporter so far has been the Heritage Grant, that's a federal funding, as well as City of Guelph. University of Guelph has always supported us through donation. So this year we are hoping that, you know, we are, we are going to actually work together. So that's my hope. And with the rest of the organization, I would absolutely love to work with the Connecting Canadians because I believe in ancient wisdom, meaning grandma's wisdom and uh, grandma, grandpa's uh, traditions and how we can actually learn from it, particularly if it's multicultural and, and only if it's multicultural, I, I, I come in. So that that's it for me. Um, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sinsidra. Um, no questions so far, but I, I do have a quick question. So what would be the next step for someone who's interested in volunteering with, with you? And how would that look like? Um, if you could comment on that. OK, thank you. See, uh, I have to tell you our website has been a very static website. Yes, I, I can provide my website, but we are actually launching our new website end of this month. And at the end of this month, we are actually bringing in a new feature in our website called multicultural calendar. And I believe this is the first time we are doing it. I think there have been multi faith calendars, but they have not been multicultural calendar. We are going to be recording through the community. So we are going to have more like a forum where people actually say like, oh, Chinese New Year, this is the date we celebrate and why we celebrate it. And, and if there are pictures or videos they want to upload of how the community celebrated. So that's going to be one, how the volunteers can help. I think, like I said, sky's the limit. We don't have any creative, uh, you know, concrete plans as such, except we want students who will want to. Uh, there are three things what I'm expecting from the University of uh, Guelph students is one, who will be interested in supporting high school projects? Two is who will be interested in participating in podcast, where it will be more like a talk show. And right now the concept is science and science behind traditions. Who will be interested in that? And the third is, you know, the talent show is the third one. The fourth one is what's your suggestion? How do you want to be involved? More than us saying I want your help here. I think we want to leave it as what do you suggest for a better community and we'll take it from there and I think every single suggestion will be taken seriously and uh, we are a small organization. I am the only staff. I am the only staff. <laughs> so uh, we'll take it from there and take it slow and uh, just want to see how students feel they can support. OK, thank you. Uh, I have a we have one more question before I move on to the next presenter. Um, have a would the festival consider a program to pass down artistic traditions to youth uh, who are interested? And then someone shared a link from uh, ACTA. Um, OK. OK, so um, perhaps if you could take a look at that and answer mm -hmm. in a reply and I'll move on with the next uh, presenter. How is that? Very good. You know what? I really like this and that, that's why I'm saying like, you know, our mind is limited. We are close to 50. Young mind is sky's the limit. I want to hear from you. I already like that suggestion. Thank you. That's awesome. All right. Thank you, Sinsuja. Thank you. All right. And next we have uh, Elise from the Ontarian, uh, which is our campus news, uh, newspaper. Uh, Elise, just give me one quick sec. Yeah, sure. There you go, and you're live. Perfect, thank you so much. So hi everyone, my name is Elise Magar. I'm the editor-in-chief at the Ontarian, the University of Guelph's campus newspaper. I'm here with Patrick, our marketing manager and we're really excited to share some of our volunteer opportunities with you this afternoon. We want to open with a brief video that gives a quick overview of why you might want to volunteer with us. Welcome to The Ontarian. We are the University of Guelph Community's independent nonprofit newspaper. My name is Elise and I'm the Editor-in-Chief. Volunteering with us is not only a great way to support your community as well as the values of a free press, but also a great way to help yourself. Here you will get the chance to develop and improve a variety of skills ranging from technical skills in writing and researching to transferable skills in time management and communication. 
You have the chance to explore your passions and curiosities as we are happy to provide a platform for your writing, artwork, photography, videography, poetry, and more. Above all, the opportunities we have here are unique and exciting and we'd love to share them with you. So please feel free to call or email us to chat about what interests you. Everyone is welcome, regardless of experience, and we look forward to hearing from you. So uh, moving on to slide number two. Um, the video that you just saw talks a bit about why you might want to volunteer with the Ontarian, uh, but we also think it says something about what we are passionate about. This video was made in-house by Nick, who is our multimedia content creator. Uh, Nick came up with every shot in this video. He even learned how to use Google Maps and some fancy editing techniques to make the intro and the outro. This is really what we are about at the Ontarian. We want to give our staff and volunteers the opportunity to take their visions and learn how to make them real, while at the same time learning new skills and contributing them to our community. The way we do that is by publishing our campus community newspaper, which acts as a forum to cover the news and tell the stories that affect U of G students, as well as the broader community. We publish a wide range of content, including news, opinion, photography, satire, art, movie and music reviews, both in print and online. So if you move to slide three, you'll see two types of volunteering. So we have the two types, editorial and board of directors. Editorial involves photography, art, and writing articles. Uh, but if content creation isn't for you, you can stay tuned for what Patrick has to say about our leadership and professional opportunities for board of directors. Um, but first, let's talk about the editorial side of things. So on the next slide, This is our news slide. Uh, so a lot happens in our community on the university grounds or in even downtown Guelph or Guelph in general. And we make it our mission to report the facts and keep our readers informed. And then the next slide shows some of our review content that we've created. Uh, so if you have a bunch of great books that you'd like to share with others or you want to rave about your favorite TV show, you can do that for sure with us. We love writing and reading reviews. We also like lifestyle content as well. We have lifestyle topics ranging anywhere from fashion trends to recipes to workout suggestions. If you have a quick, easy and delicious pizza recipe you want to share, odds are that it would sound pretty good to most of our readers too. Um, social issues and activism. We also believe it's very critical that we provide a voice to those who have been previously marginalized. As we're fond of saying here, journalism can be a very powerful tool in improving our communities and society, and we strive to create an environment that embraces the hard work that folks are engaged in to make the world a better place. So here we have some examples of photography that we published. Um, get outside and take some photos. You can snap shots of speakers, musicians, artwork, or even a fancy like charcuterie board. What's a paper without visual content? You could help us liven up the page with colorful, striking imagery or by capturing iconic moments in time, such as when Bill Nye came to the U of G. Uh, this is showing some opinion pieces that we published. If you ever think there's too many assignments in class or that your textbooks are too expensive, if you have an opinion about the deer statues outside the farmer's market or even about everyone's favorite controversial pizza topping pineapple we want to hear about it we want your opinions whether it's a serious subject or something more lighthearted. we really want you to tell our readers what you think your interests maybe you don't want to write about the news or an in-depth movie review maybe you have a hobby or interest that you think no one would be interested in well, if that's so, then I'm going to tell you that you're wrong. I guarantee if you have something to share, no matter how niche it might be, people will want to hear it. And that concludes the editorial side of things. Now we can move over to Patrick, who'll tell you a bit more about the board of directors. Hi, everyone. So uh, many of you may know the Ontarian as a newspaper. 
Uh, but that newspaper is actually published by an organization uh, called the Ontarian Incorporated. So even before writing and editing begins, it takes a lot of behind the scenes work to get that newspaper out there. Hiring, paying our staff, managing the funding that we get, and just making decisions about the future of the newspaper. These are just a few of the things that we have to do. Although we're a nonprofit, there's still a lot of business that has to get done to ensure that our wonderful staff and volunteers can make that newspaper. A lot of this work is done by our volunteer board of directors who oversee all of this business. So just a quick thing about the board, you don't have to be super into business uh, and finance in order to volunteer on our board. If you're interested in leadership or learning how to work on a team or even just improving your confidence, our board is an amazing chance to do that. Uh, while it might seem intimidating, our board is actually a learning environment and you're not expected to have any experience at all. Uh, we're there to teach you everything that you'd need to know. And uh, just before I hand it back to Elise, I can quickly relate my own personal experience with the board because that's actually how I first started out with the Ontarian. Uh, when I started out, I was actually very shy. I never thought of myself as being uh, capable of leadership skills uh, or anything like that, but I uh, really enjoyed problem solving and thought journalism was really important. And this was kind of the way that I could participate in journalism. And being on the board of directors really taught me a lot about how a business works and how to act in a professional environment. Uh, and most importantly, it really taught me what I was capable of. So uh, on the board, that's really what we're about. So um, feel free to reach out to Elise or myself to learn a bit more about that. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Elise. Thank you. Uh, so why volunteer with the Ontarian? We have many opportunities for our volunteers. We believe in the values of self-improvement and continuous learning. So you don't have to worry about how much experience you have, even if it's none at all. We want to use journalism as a force for good because without it, we don't have a democracy. By working with us, you're taking part in something that's bigger than yourself for sure. We want everyone to have the chance to help us tell our community stories, and we will work with you to make that happen. By volunteering with us, you can improve your communication skills through collaboration, teamwork, discussion, and more. You can find your communication skills improving as well as your sense of confidence. You improve your resume and chances of getting a job. Creating original content is a major plus to list on anyone's resume and the skills you build with us are also very transferable. And then lastly, you can foster inclusion. Writing stories often calls for interviewing people and by reaching out to new people, you help expand not only the Ontarian's network, but also your own. Once again, everyone is welcome. The Ontarian is a team that brings many different skill sets to the table to create inclusive, informational and fun paper for our community. And then our last slide, thank you so much. We really appreciate everybody participating and listening to us tell you about what we're so passionate about. Please don't hesitate to talk to myself or Patrick about your ideas. Um, my email is listed there. Everyone can take note if they'd like to get in contact with me. I'm very open to any email, any conversation you'd like to have. And before ending, I just wanna mention that in February, we're having our very first virtual volunteer meeting. It's gonna be a good chance for anyone interested in volunteering to meet and chat with our staff and other volunteers. And it'll be a space to talk about what's in the news and topics that you might be interested in writing or creating content for. So thank you so much again, everybody, all the best. And we're really looking forward to hearing with you. Thank you. Thank you, Elise and uh, Patrick. Thank you for your sharing. Uh, there are two questions uh, quickly for you. Uh, how many readers do you have uh, of the stat uh, that folks are wondering? And can articles be anonymous? Uh, I can speak to the number of readers. Um, it's a little bit difficult to measure that, but um, we know it's somewhere over 5,000 per issue. Uh, that can fluctuate depending on whether students are uh, writing their exams or whether it's our big back to school Guelph 101 issue, but we generally measure it over, as over 5,000 um, up to 10,000 for our Guelph 101 issue. Awesome. And then Elise, would you be able to answer the anonymous question? Yeah, for sure. Um, we usually do not publish content that is anonymous, just in terms of keeping like the journalistic integrity. 
We always um, attribute our information to sources and to people as many people have differing opinions. Um, so if you wanted to create different types of content like photography, artwork, video, um, there would be less connected to like yourself as an individual, like your identity would be more, fo more focused, focused on your artwork. But in general, if you're writing an article, whether it's like a news article or an opinion piece, we really, we pride ourselves in like attributing like sources to it. So, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, again, if you have more questions for Elise or Patrick, or any of the presenters already presented, please drop your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, there's still a, a few of you in the room, so please uh, stay on. We, we still have two really awesome opportunities that you want to uh, hear about. Uh, one from uh, Autism Doc Services, uh, who is coming up next, and then another opportunity with uh, cf for u Radio and Media uh, Center uh, with Jenny. So uh, please stay on and uh, we'll continue. All right, Jenny, you will go next. If you don't mind sharing your screen with me quickly. Sure. And you're live. Great, thanks. Hi there, my name's Janine and I'm the Volunteer and Adoptions Manager at Autism Dog Services. And I'm just gonna go over a few of the opportunities we have for volunteers at our organization. So quickly, um, we are a registered Canadian charity and we place service dogs for children with autism up to the age of 18 years of age across uh, southwestern Ontario. So we do a small region from about London through to the western side of Toronto, um, the GTA down to Hamilton, Niagara, and that's including, of course, um, KW, Guelph, Cambridge areas as well. We focus on a small region of Ontario so that we can provide really customized service to our clients who receive our dogs. So we're able to go in and work with them one-to-one -one in their home and in their community directly um, to make sure that their placement with their service dog is very successful. And we also continue to work with the family throughout the entire time that they have their service dog working with them. So really customized support for our families. Um, we are an accredited member of Assistance Dogs International, which is an umbrella organization that looks after all different service dog organizations around the world. Um, we choose to be a member of them, and so we follow their policies and procedures. And every five years, we need to be um, re-accredited, so they come out and test, um, go through all of our um, processes to make sure that we're following their guidelines. And we're also a member of the Canadian Association of Guide and Assistance Dog Schools, which is um, customized just to Canada and the larger service dog schools are part of that organization to sort of better the processes within Canada. So our volunteer opportunities that I'll touch on today, we have a foster puppy raising, our puppy sitter program, and then an administrative or um, general position, volunteer position. So puppy raising is our most involved volunteer position. So these individuals would raise a puppy from the age of about eight weeks of age up until um, around 12 to 18 months of age for um, and that, that period of time can vary as well. And you're responsible for all aspects of looking after the day to day care of the puppy in your home. So um, feeding, grooming, exercising on a daily basis as well as basic training and teaching the dog commands and good manners um, and socializing the dog into everything that they might need to be exposed to before they become an adult working service dog. So the socializing is a really important part of the puppy raising process as well. Um, you're required to attend um, puppy classes every other week in Guelph or Cambridge for the entire duration of having the puppy with you. Um, the Guelph classes are held on Thursday evenings and the Cambridge classes are held on Wednesday evenings, so always in the evening for our puppy classes. You must also have the ability to transport the puppy to and from veterinary appointments, so access to a vehicle in order to get the puppy to those appointments. And you would work um, regularly with our ADS trainers and staff to maintain regular communication about the puppy's training progress and health issues, how it's coming along, any issues that come up in that regard. So what we would provide to you uh, as a puppy raiser is many of the things that you would need for the dog. So we provide a crate. We do want the dog crate trained and making sure that it's safe and um, in a safe space when it's not being supervised. All of the food is donated by Yukonuba, so um, the food is completely covered for the puppy throughout the entire time. 
All the equipment, so leash, collar, the training vest is all supplied by us. And the veterinary care is 100% covered as well. You would be supplied with a training manual that would go over all of the expectations as the puppy grows and develops, um, training wise, health wise, everything is covered in our manual. And we provide obviously the puppy training classes, as I mentioned, and also one to one training sessions with our, um, our puppy training staff. So the volunteers would provide toys and treats for the puppy, a safe home environment, any cleanup supplies that would be required for looking after a puppy, especially when they're little, lots of accidents can happen. Um, a dog bed or blanket if you desire, um, and most importantly, a great amount of time um, and commitment to the process, looking after the puppy, all aspects of its sort of day-to-day -day needs, as well as the training, it's quite a, an involved commitment in that regard. Um, and travel costs to uh, puppy class and to make it to the vet as well, those would be covered by our volunteers. So how to apply, you can visit our website. There's an application right on our website. Um, once the application is received, we would put out a re request for a reference letter and then we would do a screening interview. Those are ideally done in person in your home, but currently with COVID, obviously we're having to do those virtually. So any of those currently would be done online. Um, and then once you're approved at that stage, you would attend an orientation session that would give you all of the information you'd need prior to starting with a puppy more detail on our expectations of you as a puppy raiser, as far as the day-to-day -day training of the dog. Um, you get to meet our puppy program staff and some of our puppies and um, just get some exposure to sort of what to expect as you start out with a puppy. Um, if puppy raising is interesting to you, but um, the commitment involved is it's quite involved, um, is too much. Puppy sitting is a good option. So this is short term, uh, providing a short term home for puppies in training. Um, if you have a flex schedule that changes sort of week to week or month to month, um, your work commitments or school commitments vary and you're just not sure that every day for the next year plus is something you could commit to, um, then this is a good option. If you don't know where you're gonna be in the next six months, um, this provides you much more flexibility. So there's no required minimum commitment for this. So you can do it as your schedule permits. If you're only available weekends or you're only available every other month or just certain weeks out of the month, um, it's totally flexible as to what your, your routine is. Um, so short term sitting could be as little as a few hours for our littlest puppies um, to overnight or a weekend. Um, up to several weeks or even a couple months, depending on what's needed for that particular dog. You're also provided with an information session, so you have an idea of what our expectations are of you and the puppy um, before you start puppy sitting. You must have a safe home environment um, so that the puppy is kept safe while they're with you. And all equipment and supplies are provided with the puppy, so there'd be nothing you would need to provide. It would come with the puppy when it's dropped off, and then you would send it back with the puppy once you were finished. And if hands on with the dog is not really your thing, um, we do have other opportunities that you could um, help out with. So um, administrative proje projects, um, particularly marketing and fundraising. We are a home based organization, so all of our staff work from home as well, um, especially during this time. Um, this would be something you would provide from your home. Um, in non COVID times, we do run special events and fundraising in person. Uh, recognition uh, events, things like that, where we need hands on on the day of support. So that would be something hopefully one day in the future, once those events are running again, we might need uh, support with or help with. Um, and we also, of course, have a board of directors. So um, the possibility of joining as a board member is also there. Um, they're always looking for a variety of skill sets, um, things outside of their particular skills um, as well. So that's another opportunity as well. Um, that uh, that sorry application is also on our website. It's a, just a general volunteer application. So you would go to the website for that as well. Um, and the puppy sitter application is also a separate application from the puppy foster um, on our website as well. So each one has an individual application form. And then if you have any questions, feel free to contact me by email. I'm happy to answer any specific questions about um, any of our volunteer opportunities that we have. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Jenny. Um, there was no question as of just now, but there was a, oh, there is a question coming in, uh, but there was also a quick hi from um, Robbie, <laughs> if you recognize that name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the audience. Hi. Okay, so we have a quick question. As a puppy sitter, would we need to take puppies to classes in the vet as well? So not necessarily. Um, if you're short term, you're just doing a weekend or um, puppy classes, as I mentioned, happen on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So if you don't have the puppy during that period of time, you're not attending classes. Um, even if you do, if you've just, uh, if you just are a short term, it happens to fall on a Wednesday, but um, you're not available. You're not required to come to puppy classes necessarily. Um, and the vet, we hope you won't have to go to the vet during your time puppy sitting. Um, if there's a, a medical emergency, obviously we would need you to um, be able to transport the puppy to get the help that it needs. Um, but we hope it's very infrequent that we have um, need for the puppies to see the vet during sitting. So it's not something you should expect necessarily. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, again, please drop any more questions you may have into the Q&A box. I'll move on to the last presenter, uh, Jenny from CFRU. Hi, everybody. So my name is Jenny. I am the volunteer and mobile studio coordinator for CFRU. CFRU Radio and Media Center has been a creative and collaborative bridge between Guelph's campus and community for 40 years. Uh, it's actually our 41st anniversary next week, which is very exciting. With State of the Art Studios equipment and software, our experienced staff offer students and community members the opportunity to learn about and produce radio programs, podcasts, live streaming and recorded video, audio documentaries, performance events, and recorded music. We engage about 200 volunteers annually. Uh, that ranges from people helping once a week on regular programs to people who come once or twice a year for special events. And uh, yeah, volunteers do basically everything, which is uh, kind of super exciting. So I do want to show this video that Ray has kindly queued up, and this gives you an idea of what our remote volunteering opportunities look like. So they're all kind of remote geared versions of what goes into the operations of the station. So Ray, you can play that out. CFRU Radio and Media Centre offers Guelph a volunteer-driven alternative to mainstream and public radio. For 40 years, we have provided access to the media to groups and individuals who would otherwise have little access through mainstream media outlets. We have state-of-the-art studios and equipment and a huge digital and physical music library, but as a safety precaution during this pandemic, we have closed our station to the public and are operating with the help of remote volunteers. As a volunteer, you can help in our music library. By reviewing and preparing Canadian music for the air. You can produce and host a radio show. Producing music shows by using audio software, such as Audition or Audacity, or spoken word programs and interview people remotely. You can help us in our programming department. setting up rebroadcasts of previous shows. You can help us with training. Troubleshooting with volunteers remotely or creating tutorials. Help in our tech department.
by helping with our station website, or editing audio and video clips for sharing on our video page and YouTube channel. And we can always use help with station outreach. You can engage with the community, post and share our posts on social media, and spread the word about CFRU. Get involved today by contacting volunteer at CFRU.ca. Check out our website at CFRU.ca. The music for this video is the song Blue Moon by Man Meets Bear off the album Dream BC. Okay, so that was our remote volunteering video. Um, so some other aspects to getting involved and why you might want to is it really helps to develop your skills from the technical aspects of sound recording to interview skills and communication skills. So I really find that the skill sets that go into podcast production or radio show production um, or even just the moving pieces to organizing different projects are all things that are super transferable to other professions. So we have tons of people who get involved with CFRU if they know there's going to be some amount of PR uh, or working with the community and uh, a lot of the work I do does work with seniors or school-aged children and so all of that stuff even if it is for radio in the case of CFRU uh, also just has a lot of other benefits to you that can go really well alongside the other stuff you're working on. Um, I want to highlight a few things that set us apart from other radio stations, just in case you're not familiar with the campus and community model. So some of the main things would be um, that we're locally focused, that we're interacted with our audience and volunteer driven. So it is an opportunity for volunteers to be in that front and center role and really take a leadership role um, and have some autonomy over what they do. Uh, whereas a lot of other radio stations may only have one or two hired positions. And if they have volunteers, they would be in a more sort of intern or behind the scenes role, there really is an opportunity to be kind of uh, front and center and in a really great way. And uh, and that leads to a local focus and an interactive piece because it's people just like you who are producing the content that you're listening to. Um, also being an alternative to mainstream audio. Um, so being a platform for content that doesn't have uh, that access otherwise. Uh, we have a role of activist programming, so we partner with a lots of amazing community organizations and people in the community who are really engaged in environmental activism, um, alternative politics, uh, so things that public radio like the CBC maybe has to be a little bit uh, careful about because of the way that they're funded by taxpayer dollars, uh, because we are really uh, for the community and campus. We want to make sure that the news issues that you are concerned about and want to give a platform for have of space to be aired. Uh, we have a lot of crossover with the Ontarian. I'm really glad we're on this presentation together today. Similar to the Ontarian, um, all of our news would have to be backed up with resources and facts and research, but it is an opportunity to share more and different things, which is exciting. Um, and just including communities that are often marginalized or ignored in other media in terms of giving them the opportunity to learn these skills as well. And um, you don't have to have any previous radio experience. We provide all the training for free remotely and you do not have to be a university student. I am happy to be presenting this for a lot of university students today, but if you do have friends that are not university students, that's fine as well. Um, I did kind of want to run one more short video, but we can do it at the very end so anyone that has to leave can leave. But um, one new project that we've presented during the pandemic is our mini interviews project and we presented it as a means of trying to get even more additional voices onto the airwaves while recognizing that committing to an ongoing radio show during this time could be a bit intimidating when people sometimes don't know what their workload is going to look like. So the mini interview project is an additional thing you can do instead or alongside the traditional volunteer roles. And the mini interviews are typically running about five to 20 minutes. And they're an opportunity for anybody who identifies as a Guelph community member. So whether you are 
attending school here from afar, uh, or you work in Guelph but live somewhere else, or you live here in the city, um, you can host one and you can interview basically literally anybody. So you could, uh, some of the popular choices have maybe been a family member, a roommate, uh, a business that you're really excited about that's doing something cool, and maybe your professor. Uh, we have lots of awesome crossover with university courses. So that's another opportunity to consider that's um, more of a sort of one-off and spontaneous way of getting involved. And uh, it could be a good way to test the waters if you want to see if this is for you before committing to an ongoing show. So yeah, I'm Jenny and I did post in the comments that we have our next general orientation session this next Monday, January 25th at 4 p.m. and it runs for about an hour. And the orientation session is the first stage for any area of volunteering. So you don't have to attend it to participate in the mini interview series, but if there's any other area you're curious about, it will give you an overview of all the basic things you need to know about CFRU. And uh, you'll see my excited smiling face there to tell you more. So yes, thanks everybody. Introducing CFRU 93.3 FM's mini interview project. This is a new initiative for the COVID-19 era, aimed at helping you connect with your community and bring a variety of new voices and perspectives to our airwaves during this unusual time. Anyone who identifies as a Guelph community member, whether physically living here, attending school, or working here from afar, can choose a guest to interview, record a conversation using Zoom or another online meeting platform, and send in a short interview, ideally around 5 to 20 minutes, to air on our airwaves throughout our broadcast week. Your guest could be absolutely anyone, here are a few ideas to consider. A friend or family member you haven't seen since the pandemic began. Your next door neighbor. A person running a local business that interests you. A musician you know. Or your favorite professor. Just make sure the conversation is radio friendly and your guest is made aware that they will be broadcast on CFRU. Here are the simple steps for producing your first interview. Download and install Zoom at zoom.us. Programs like Skype will work as well, but Zoom has a handy record function built in, so we'll be using that for this video. Once the application is open, you can schedule a future meeting or start one immediately. Go to the Meetings menu, select Invite, and Copy Invitation. Create an email to your guest and paste the invitation into the body. Send off the email. If you haven't already done so, start your meeting at the agreed upon time. Headphones are recommended. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, click the record button. We recommend that you choose to record to your computer rather than the cloud. As the host, you will receive a notification when your guest attempts to join. Click Admit. Introduce yourself and ask your guest to introduce themselves so they can give some background information for listeners who may not know them. And have a nice conversation. Hello, you're listening to the Mini Interview Project on CFRU 93.3 FM. This is Brian the Dog reporting, and I have a special guest today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jenny the Rat. At the end of your interview, click End Meeting. You will receive a message that the recording is being saved to your computer. By default, it will likely save in your Documents folder under Zoom with a subfolder named by the date of the meeting. Remember to name the file with a distinctive name save it with a .mp4 extension. To submit the interview to CFRU, just go to cfru.ca slash mini dash interview. Fill in the required info and drag the file onto the submission page and click submit. You can record as many interviews as you like. No previous recording or interviewing experience is required. We can offer guidance and support. We're happy to offer basic interview tips and best practices. Additional support for editing may be available. Just let us know what's needed. To receive further information, contact Jenny at volunteer at CFRU.ca with the subject mini interview mailing list. CFRU offers this initiative as a way to counteract isolation and maintain community connections in this challenging time. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and stay tuned. Thank you, Jenny. Um, uh, what I'll do is I'll share the link uh, to the mini uh, interview project with participants through email. 
Sure. Uh, and then there are two questions for you to answer if uh, you could take a look at the Q&A, but I will read it to you as well. Uh, what kinds of shows can volunteers produce and host? And do you play student music? Yeah, so um, I'll answer the student music thing first, of course, and absolutely. We have a whole local music library shelf. So for hard copies of CDs and vinyl that we've received, it all goes there. We also have a massive digital music library and we have a submission process of sending music to the music library and then we have music library and volunteers that review everything. Um, but yeah, every, I would say especially local and independently produced music would be at the top of our list of stuff we'd be super excited about. We even have some shows that dedicate um, whole time slots to local content. So absolutely student music is so encouraged to be submitted. We do for our music library purposes uh, request require albums to be at least three songs or more. So if it's just a single song, it's better to reach out to us individually so we can find a way to highlight that or share that. Um, but if you want to add your album to our library, you can do that um, as well. All that information is on our website. And in terms of what shows volunteers can produce and host, um, my simplest answer would be any and everything. Um, we do have uh, programming and policy guidelines. So in terms of the language used and the materials that way, there's some guides, but um, I guess the priority will be given to shows that are different than the ones that are already on the air. If you look at our program schedule, which is one of the first things that come up on the top of our website, uh, we have a lot of different examples there. So we have a show dedicated to mixed martial arts, one about biking culture. We have uh, shows in about seven different languages, so hosted and music content in those languages. Um, new Canadian music shows. Uh, it's kind of all over the map and it changes all the time, which is amazing because it's volunteer driven. So we get new people coming on board to produce new shows and we have people who move on and do other things. And so, yeah, um, absolutely open to your ideas. Awesome. And one last quick question before we uh, we wrap up. Does the radio pro produce lots of videos? And if so, what kind of content? Yeah, I would recommend checking out our videos page on our website. Uh, we've been posting a lot of tutorials during the pandemic just as a way to try to have our um, training facilities go a bit further. That, uh, so we do one on one trainings as well. But if there's basic stuff that we get asked a lot. Um, sometimes those, so if you go, you can see tutorials on like basic setup for a home studio, uh, so using certain types of USB microphones. We have our posted our workshop on mini interview skills, uh, which is just interviewing skills in general. Um, so there's those kinds of how-to videos and there's a ton of videos from our green screen in studio performances. So those were pre-pandemic. We haven't figured out a pandemic version of that yet, um, but that's another opportunity. We have bands coming and perform in our studios and that will go live at the time and then be saved to our YouTube channel and our videos page on our site. So lots of stuff intersecting, of course, with bands and musicians, but also special events and tutorials. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, that was great. Uh, similar to most of the um, partners over here, seems like there's tons of different opportunities that you can get involved with. Uh, so please, uh, check out the announcement with their contact information and reach out to them with any other questions you may have. And if you're a little bit overwhelmed with all the information, simply just email us uh, to Student Volunteer Connections at svc at eoguelph.ca and we'll answer any of your questions related to volunteering. All right, we will be signing off now. Thank you so much for joining in today. Thank you for the partners as well. Uh, we'll see you, I guess, throughout the semester because this will be the, the last uh, information session for us. But thank you so much and see you next time.